What is the Japanese Prime Minister's military strategy? Fumio Kishida says that his government will create a new national security strategy and he's pledged more spending on defence capabilities. But what's his intention and will it work? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Japan is scrambling to boost its military strength to counter what Tokyo sees as rising threats from China. In his national address on Monday, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida emphasized his goal to bolster the military over the next five years. But with the weak yen, he's struggling to find the finances to do it. His predecessor, Shinzo Abe, focused heavily on shoring up reserves. But Kishida has low approval ratings and needs to regain the trust of the public to fulfill his government's key policies. In an integrated and strong manner, we will consider the content of our defence capabilities, which will be necessary for the drastic strengthening of our defence capabilities within five years, as well as grasp the size of the budget and secure financial resources for that purpose. We will draw conclusion during the budgeting process. By the end of this year, we will formulate a new national security strategy, which we have been discussing. Along with China, the threat from nearby North Korea remains a top concern for Japan. For the first time, Pyongyang launched four rockets in one week, something Japan's vice defense minister says is unacceptable. Since the beginning of this year, North Korea has repeatedly launched missiles with unprecedented frequency and in new ways, including provocation escalating launches, such as launching ballistic missiles four times in quick successions in the past week alone, North Korea's actions threaten the peace and safety, not only for Japan, but also the region and the international community, and are absolutely impermissible. Well, Japan's goal of military expansion is both expensive and controversial. The Defense Ministry requested more than $43 billion for the 2023 fiscal year. That's the highest budget request in history and more than 1% of the country's GDP. The plan also includes introducing preemptive strike capabilities and plans to further promote nuclear energy. Critics say this could violate the country's pacifist constitution and raises safety concerns stemming from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. Japan doesn't plan on growing its military alone. Kishida said he hopes to maintain dialogue with China while working with the US and other allies to promote Indo-Pacific security. All right, there is much to discuss with our guests for today's program. Let's bring them in uh, from uh, Shizuoka. Sujiro Takashita, professor at the University of Shizuoka in Tokyo. Uh, we've got uh, Craig Mark, a professor at the Faculty of International Studies at uh, Kiritsu Women's University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Um, Sujiro, let's start with you. Just how controversial are Japan's military spending plans for the next year? OK, we've heard a lot about this $43 billion figure, the highest ever, just over 1% of GDP. But, but hang on, previous administrations have tended to keep defence spending around the 1% GDP mark. What's, what's so remarkable, then, about this budget? Well, you know, 1% had been what one would call the defense line for many people, uh, acceptance line. And uh, this was thought to be a line that shouldn't be crossed. Uh, but, you know, with this very strong aggression that we're getting from China uh, and also uh, from North Korea, as you just reported, which in my opinion is virtually China, uh, as their, their North Korea's big daddy is actually, you know, China. And seeing what's happening in Europe as well, I think it's very, very clear um, along with the fact that during the uh, days of Trump, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, I should say, uh, awareness about, you know, increasing Japan's defense spending. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if it goes well, easily beyond 1%, uh, certainly targeting the 2% line, which is the request of the previous president by the United States. Uh, Craig, uh, do you agree with that? Will Japan's defense spending increase to around 2% of GDP in the coming years? Why does the prime minister uh, and his party think it's so important for them to do so? Uh, well, uh, as has been said, they're very much aware of the uh, potential instability 
uh, in the region with the rising power of China, uh, the potential threat from North Korea, and of course the uh, uh, divisions with uh, Russia uh, since the Ukraine war. And uh, there's been discussions within the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, within the various uh, uh, policy committees of raising it to 2%, uh, possibly by the end of the decade. So this uh, incremental increase in defence spending, which has been happening every year since uh, the, the Abe administration uh, returned to power in 2012, uh, that uh, trend just is going to keep on accelerating. And uh, if Japan does reach uh, 2% of GDP, that'll make it the third largest military spender uh, in the world after the US and China. Uh, currently, it's rated about uh, eighth, uh, spending around $50 billion US per year. So that will be a radical departure. And also, uh, as mentioned in the intro, the uh, capabilities of the defence forces are going to change. Uh, the counter-strike capability, uh, extending the range of missiles uh, so they could potentially uh, be uh, used to, uh, as the uh, defence forces say, deter attacks on Japan uh, of over a thousand kilometre ranges. Uh, they've re, uh, uh, restructured the self-defence forces to uh, have more deployments in the south, in these islands of uh, south of uh, the Okinawa, which uh, confront the uh, Senkaku Islands, claimed by China as the uh, Dayu Islands, and uh, increasing a whole range of capabilities in cyber warfare, base based systems, all these are very radical changes which are going to come about uh, throughout the rest of this decade. So, Jero, uh, picking up from what Craig was saying there, it, I mean, it, it is perhaps understandable that Japan would need a strong deterrence, but why would it need counter-strike capabilities? And, and is that not at odds with the country's pacifist constitution? Well, the meaning of the pacifist constitution has been altered, as you know, and uh, now we are at a point where we can and will defend, for example, our allied forces. So that has been you know, rectified. Uh, and also, I think many people are starting to realize that, you know, by keeping the Ninth Amendment, you know, which is our peacekeeping Bible, <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, our foreign uh, forces will be staying out. On the contrary, uh, it's totally the other way around. As you saw very recently in action by North Korea, the more you left, leave them alone, you know, the more they want to be appearing on the stage. Uh, now they've been throwing over 28 missiles, I think, last year, and uh, this year already a very record-breaking number, basically to attract attention, and also having China as their you know, backbone um, they do not have to worry about sanctions because we talk about sanctions in North Korea, but, you know, the fact of the matter is 90 percent of the trade is done with China. So, you know, the sanction by other countries aren't really going to hurt you know, North Korea. And having this big war of hegemony between the United States and China and Japan clearly siding with the United States, especially during the days of, you know, Mr. Abe, um, it's very, very clear that, you know, uh, North Koreans are virtually, you know, able to be the bad boy of the region uh, thanks to the backup of China. So, you know, these issues are starting to gradually sink in to many of the Japanese. And I think for that reason, I think there'll be a very clear backup. That said, of course, that is under the assumption that, you know, economic situation will be stable. And that is a big question. Yeah, we're, we're going to come on to the e the economic situation in, in, a, in a little while, uh, Sujira. But first, Craig... Um, Japan's new defence minister said on Monday that the international community is, quote, entering a new era of crisis and that Japan needed to be adequately ready to counter this. I mean, what, what did he mean? Who or what does Japan see as the main threats to its security right now? Uh, well, uh, as been mentioned, uh, North Korea is obviously a direct threat with its missile testing. And uh, there's even rumours uh, going around in the uh, South Korean media uh, that maybe they might conduct an underground nuclear test uh, in the next couple of weeks. And that would definitely uh, focus uh, uh, the attention on the potential threat of North Korea. Uh, but, of course, uh, China is the main uh, hegemonic challenger. And, of, of course, uh, 
just uh, very recently in August, we had the uh, Taiwan Straits crisis where uh, the in response to the visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, the uh, Chinese military launched their largest scale uh, military exercises around the waters of Taiwan and at its airspace, and China itself tested ballistic missiles, some of which landed uh, in the economic ex exclusion zone of Japan uh, near the Senkaku Islands. Uh, so that is the biggest long-term threat which uh, Japan is considering, as well as Russia, uh, in the wake of the Ukraine war. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida has strongly condemned uh, Russia's illegal invasion. And uh, Japan has actually uh, given nearly a billion dollars in aid and funding, financial support, as well as non-lethal military uh, equipment to Ukraine. So uh, those are the uh, main uh, threats which are being used to justify uh, this uh, radical restructuring of the self-defence forces and this huge increase uh, long term into the defence budget. And that will require a greater cooperation with Japan's security partners. And that, of course, includes the United States, which still has the largest uh, uh, basing of troops and military forces outside of the United States in uh, the uh, bases that it has throughout Japan, uh, mostly in Okinawa, though. But uh, very interestingly, Japan is increasing its uh, security uh, cooperation with other countries, Australia in particular, uh, the uh, beginning of this year, the reciprocal access agreement was uh, signed, and that means Australian forces and Japanese forces will operate uh, much more closely together. And uh, just the last weekend, there was a meeting of the Trilateral Secure, uh, Strategic Dialogue Defence Ministers in Hawaii, and they have also committed to uh, uh, a shared strategy in the uh, Indo-Pacific region, much more closer trilateral military uh, exercises. And even in the Philippines, uh, self-defense forces have joined uh, South Korea, Philippine and American forces. And also very importantly, South Korea. Uh, there was a trilateral exercise between us, uh, the United States, South Korea, and the Japanese uh, maritime self-defense forces. So all these things are concurrently happening to uh, uh, increase this trend of greater uh, Japanese uh, activity by the self-defence forces. All right. So, Jira, I have, a, I have a feeling I know the answer. Uh, having listened to what Craig was just saying there about China's increasing assertiveness and the threat from North Korea and, and everything else that he was saying, um, there's no doubt in your mind then that Japan is not using what it perceives as a regional and global threat, you know, as, as current regional and global threats, as an excuse, just an excuse to bolster its military capabilities. It is actually pursuing a perfectly reasonable uh, set of uh, defence policies, given the deteriorating security environment in the Indo-Pacific region? It's basically a geopolitical matter, and uh, I think Japan has been excessively neutral in many sense, partly because of the domestic, you know, politics that's in concern. But, you know, I think it's very, very clear now that, especially as Craig was mentioning, the forming of Quad and uh, also uh, US-Japan bilateral, you know, uh, agreements and uh, also with South Korea, it's very, very clear that you know Japan will be siding by a, the United States in the free world. If you look at in the trade side, that's also very, very clear. In fact, they're very closely correlated. Uh, you know, uh, especially with the um, the supply chain, the global supply chain problem that we're all facing right now, which is a, in fact a very big reason for this you know inflation that we're all facing. Uh, we basically have to go for security rather than just the effectiveness. And that is causing a very big cost. Partly we have to truncate China from many of our supply chain. Uh, we're moving from you know, just in time JIT into JIC, which is just in case, uh, as we saw um, that will be needed during, you know, especially days of pandemic. And the success of inclination or reliance to China is a very dangerous thing. Uh, so many countries, have basically clarified, Japan included, you know, which side they should stick on. Uh, and Japan certainly is one of them. And, you know, the military issue in Japan has very close correlation with, you know, geopolitical issue and, of course, economic issues involved. Uh, Craig, we talked about um, Japan's pacifist constitution, the, the, the defence agreement with, with Australia, among other neighbours. I mean, what, what does this 
or mean for Japan's relations with uh, its regional neighbors? I mean, and also it, its its overseas allies, the U.S. in particular. Can Japan no longer rely on the U.S. to defend it? Well, uh, the experience of the Trump administration was a, a big uh, shock for uh, allies like Japan and, and Australia too. And uh, so this has to be a part of the background thinking of why uh, Japan is increasing its uh, own self-defence forces and why it's reaching out to other partners like Australia, but also India in the Quad, although there's concerns about uh, India still remaining fairly close to Russia. Uh, but especially in Southeast Asia, uh, there's been a big uh, push by Japan to increase uh, its uh, foreign aid into uh, the ASEAN countries and in investment, so particularly with uh, countries like um, Indonesia, uh, but also increasing security cooperation with the Philippines, uh, with Vietnam, uh, the uh, Coast Guard, the Japanese Coast Guard in particular, uh, does lots of training and has supplied uh, uh, vessels and shipping to Vietnam and the Philippines, uh, but also with other uh, countries in the region. And so that has been a big focus on Japan to try and balance against uh, what's seen as the uh, rising uh, competition of China. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, China is the largest trading partner still of uh, Japan, and Japan has been concerned about the ongoing uh, lockdowns and the slowing of the uh, Chinese economy. And uh, so uh, in his speech today, uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida did say that Japan does want to maintain stable relations with China. It's the 50th anniversary of the restoration of diplomatic relations between uh, Japan and the uh, People's Republic of China. And uh, one hope that Japan has is that uh, Chinese tourists will return. That was a big focus of uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, speech today. Uh, that this month, the uh, COVID restrictions that have been put in place uh, will be abolished, and they're hoping to restore the numbers of tourism to before pre-COVID levels uh, very quickly. And the Chinese market was very important for that. So uh, uh, that's going to be a big uh, concern for Kishida. Can he keep a stable relationship with China? And can he use that relationship to help rebuild the economy? Uh, so, Jero, as Craig was saying, this speech wasn't all about uh, defence on Monday. What did you make of, of the speech? Uh, perhaps more importantly, what will the public uh, have made of it? Uh, he said that his number one priority was to revitalise the economy. I mean, you and I have been talking on television for a very long time about, about the Japanese economy. How many prime ministers before him have said that? Can it be done? Are his policies the right ones to do it? Well, it'd be pretty difficult. Um, the reason for it being is that he does have what we call the golden three years. In other words, he doesn't have any obstacles such as big elections for the next three years. So he could basically touch on structural transition. And he should. But I am not sure if he can actually do that. Of course, you know, he can talk about, as Craig was saying, about trying to increase the inbound, you know, tourism, maybe increase five trillion yen or so. But right now we have a very big headache right in front of us, which is inflationary fear. Uh, still, compared to U.S., which is above 8 percent, Europe more than that, Japan is only 2 percent. So you can see that it really hasn't hit us yet. And the reason for this is in Japan, it's cost push inflation, not like demand pool inflation like in the United States. So it doesn't seem serious. But considering the weakness of the yen, this will hurt the Japanese economy big time. Until now, weakening yen was a good news for Japanese big exporters. So it flourished, you know, the system as a whole. And that was one big success by Mr. Abe on his first arrow. But Considering the fact that, you know, this excessive move and this quick acceleration of the yen is uh, acceleration of the dollar, I'm sorry, weakening of the yen is going to hurt, you know, uh, Japan in various ways. Uh, it could hinder many of the plans that he was talking about today, which is particularly in economics and also into some of the political, uh, domestic political issues like unification church issue. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that many people tend to think that, you know, oh, we can go on forever uh, as we may have all the funds because we have the big daddy called Bank of Japan. Hmm. But, you know, let's face it, Bank of Japan has been buying back our JGB, Japan government bond, 
over 170 trillion yen in the past two years, and their current account has swelled to almost 600 trillion yen. Now, if we see a 1% increase in uh, you know, interest rate in order to fight off this week in the yen, you know, their payoff is going to be well over 5 trillion. That wipes out you know, his stories about you know, inbound benefit that's going to come out. And moreover, the net worth of Bank of Japan is only 10 trillion yen. So I have been saying, and I will say it again, Bank of Japan do not have the deep pocket like many people think. So this is a very important part of our economic plans going forward as the Bank of Japan stability isn't as stable as many people want it to be. So there are lots of problems ahead for Mr. Kishida. Mm. And to be basically, you know, conduct his, his, his you know, many his plans, he hasn't gone into concrete measures. You know, there will be a lot of obstacles, I think, ahead uh, for him, especially during this, you know, turmoil we're seeing externally. Craig, was Monday's speech enough to restore public faith in the Prime Minister's uh, government. There was a poll in the Asahi newspaper on Monday that showed that disapproval for Kishida's uh, administration was as high as 50%. I mean, can his government recover from something like that? What's done more damage to the Prime Minister? Inflation and the weak yen, the state of the economy that, that, that Sujira was talking about then, or his party's links to the unification church, the controversy over Shinzo Abe's funeral? Um, I think the Unification Church revelations in the wake of Shinzo Abe's assassination and the funeral itself have seen the big drop in uh, the approval rating for uh, Prime Minister Kishida's government. Uh, people were already a bit concerned about uh, uh, inflation even before uh, the uh, July election, uh, which uh, saw the uh, ruling party fairly comfortably returned. But the revelations of the Unification Church links to at least half of the Diet members in the LDP. That has been a huge uh, shock and it has really reverberated throughout uh, the media and political environment of Japan. So and uh, that's why uh, Mr Kishida today, uh, he didn't mention it a lot, but he just said he was aware of the problems that had occurred and he was made some mention of uh, maybe tinkering with consumer protection laws to try and cope with uh, uh, to make sure that people don't get ripped off by Unification Church in future. And uh, he will be hoping that with uh, at least uh, another three years to go before the next lower house election, that that will blow over. Uh, but the opposition parties, uh, relatively weak as they are, will still keep pushing on. Uh, this issue, and that is probably going to dog Mr Kishida uh, for quite some period of time to come. And uh, potentially, uh, if the approval ratings remain low and if the economic challenges uh, don't come about, mm. uh, given all the huge structural challenges, then Mr Kishida uh, could find himself uh, confronted by rivals even before okay. uh, the uh, next lower house election 2025. Yeah, so, so Jerry, we've got about a minute left on the, on the program. Do you just want to want to want to pick on that? I, I mean, I know you said he's got this 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 three years, but I mean, can he turn his his government's fortunes around in that time? Well, I think a lot of the ball is in the corporate sides. You know, for example, he was talking about changing lifelong employment senior system to meritocracy, which I think is a very good structural transition Japan needs, and basically will increase the wage overall. But you know, the question is, can the Japanese government, uh, you know, propel the corporations to do that? I mean, in, in the days of Mr. Abe, it's the corporation that really didn't make the move. So, you know, risk-taking capability and ability by a Japanese corporation will be asked for, not only the government. I think we've been tweeting about the government far too much. We should realize that the ball is definitely in the court of the corporations, especially this time around. Gentlemen, there we must end it. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Sajiro Takashita and Craig Mark. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.